Good afternoon and welcome. It's lovely to see so many people here this afternoon. The sun's even shining at the moment. That's great. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this special service this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to Reverend Mark Hurst's induction service. And so we welcome Mark, Izzy, and their four children, Joshua, Becca, Tabitha, and Abigail, who we've already come to love. An extra special welcome to the worshipful Mayor of Ashford. Thank you, Mayor, for being with us this afternoon. We've had a long association with Ashford Borough Council, and it feels right to have you here as we embark on that journey uh, with Mark. We want very much to continue the special relationship we've had with the council. Um, and soon, thank you for taking your time out of, no doubt, a very busy schedule to be with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. And also those people are helping to take part this afternoon, the Reverend Stuart Davidson, Reverend Jerry Newsom, and Reverend Andrew Corbwell, who's also speaking today. Uh, they've all helped and encouraged the leadership and members on our journey to find the right God-given minister to replace Alan Dinney, our minister for the past 40 years. Both he and his wife Barbara are here with us this afternoon. I'm getting to like the clap, it'll have to get louder each time. <laughs> right, let's not forget the churches where Mark and Izzy have come to from us. So, battle folk, will you give us a wave? Hooray! And also from Heathfield as well. Hooray! It's lovely, 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 lovely. Thank you all who's responded uh, to Mark's invitation to attend both locally and from afar, so thank you. Um, welcome to you all, and thanks for joining with us. I recently learned that Mark chooses me to speak at times like this because I don't talk for too long. So, <laughs> Alan, your two-minute roll is still going, you'll be glad to know. Well, good afternoon. What a great day to come together and celebrate. Thank you all for being... Uh, Mark, I hope you're really encouraged by the number of ministers who are here today. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the story before of the... Uh, the elder of the church in Scotland who uh, was asked about the gathering of ministers who said, well, ministers, they're like manure. They're good when spread over the land, but kind of nauseous when in a heap. <laughs> so, ministers, welcome. Um, <clears throat> giving a sermon on his first Sunday, a new minister heard two teenage girls in the back giggling and disturbing people. He interrupted his sermon and announced sternly, there are two of you here who have not heard a word I have said. That quietened them down. When the service was over, he went to greet people at the door. Three adults apologized for going to sleep in church, <laughs> promising it would never happen again. Well, <clears throat> you, the members of Willsborough Baptist Church, have called the Reverend Mark Hurst to be your pastor. And believing this call to be of God, he is accepted and comes now to be inducted into this office. At this significant time in the life of both church and minister, I invite you all to renew your commitment to Christ and his church, as together you share in God's mission of saving love to the world. Now, I have to admit that when I sent Mark's name here, I knew there were several other churches very interested in Mark. And uh, I was very selfish because I wanted to keep Mark and Izzy on the patch. Uh, and so I was delighted uh, when things worked out the way they did. But there's a story to be told. It's not just about my selfishness. It's actually about God's plans and God's purposes. And we live in a country at the moment that is seeing what happens when people no longer ask God what to do. And uh, so it's against that backdrop that we come to celebrate the God who is a God of planning, a God of purpose, a God who puts things together for the good of his people. So we're going to hear the story that brings us to today. And first, I'm going to ask Roger to come and share something on behalf of the church here. So, nearing Alan's retirement, and with his full support, choosing Mark as our new minister proved easier than we imagined. In fact, we started with Alan's help two years ago, beginning with what did we want in a new minister. 
meetings and much prayer later, we had a broad idea, and this enabled us to produce the church profile, which tells those ministers who are interested in seeking God's will for a move to a particular church all the information they need to know about WBC. It was only a further six months and 16 versions later that we were ready. <laughs> we even managed to keep the leadership team together, even though we had different views on whether we wanted an interregnum or not. I can't even say interregnum, I do apologise. That's just as well we didn't have one then. Right. <laughs> Initially, we had interest from three candidates, including Mark, and we interviewed two. Mark impressed us with his honesty and his scripturally based answers to our questions. And what followed was various meetings with him and Izzy, which culminated in the Peach with a View. Preach with a View, not Peach, sorry. It's going to be one of those afternoons. I won't get asked to do this again, we're all right. <laughs> There was no doubt that his preaching that day was inspired by the Holy Spirit as he made the impression on us that service at the Q&A session afterwards that afternoon with both Mark and Izzy, a day that we will remember for years to come in this church. So decision time came about. As the whole church continued to pray, the leadership met, and with all our thoughts on interregnum now gone, this was the man we wanted, and we felt sure that this was a confirmation from God. So the special church meeting, sounds like an exemption all, doesn't it? So the special church meeting was set for the following Sunday afternoon. The leadership made our recommendation to the church and we voted. And this is the really good part about it. The answer was 99%, including 100% affirmation from non-members who shared in that special church meeting. I don't think you can get much better than that, Mark. It was with joy that I phoned Mark and Izzy as soon as the voting was announced, yeah, I was excited, and told him the good news. And Mark's answer was immediate. He wanted to be the next minister of Wilsmer Baptist Church. And here we are this afternoon, putting the final formal touch to his ministry here at WBC. I do feel that the folk at the BBC, no, not that BBC, but the Battle Baptist Church did not warn us that his preaching would raise the roof. In fact, we've already had to repair it, so can I send you the bill? <laughs> Seriously, though, thank you for the love and encouragement both Battle and Health Heathfield invested in Mark, Izzy and family. So now they'll become part of the Willsborough family, and as we couldn't be happier to have you, or more excited to see what our God has planned for us. Thank you. Well, during that interregnum <laughs> you, you sort of you did appoint a moderator and uh, Jerry who's one of our regional ministers is going to come and share a little bit about the story from his perspective uh, oh good afternoon everybody um, it's uh, been interesting in recent times that uh, Willsborough is the third church to my knowledge uh, to do things something uh, do things differently uh, particularly within the Baptist Settlement Programme. Uh, Gravesend have done it. Uh, my own church in Tenterden did it. Uh, and uh, this church did it as well. And what I mean by that is that um, the fact that uh, the pastor was still here when the early discussions took place with regards to what next and who next. And I was delighted, oh, a long, long time ago, uh, when Alan said, uh, Jerry, do you fancy coming on the journey with us? Uh, with the leadership team uh, and uh, I said of course I will and uh, I remember fondly uh, the leaders and I uh, meeting at uh, MAF up the road here for a couple of Saturday mornings lots of coffee lots of buns and cake and stuff like that so if you're wondering uh, you know in the settlement program what leaders get up to then you've got a good idea it's all around food um, but then what church activity isn't all around food um, and it was a delight just to be with the leadership team here at this church. Uh, the fascinating aspect that I discovered, uh, I, or I found myself in, uh, was the fact that um, uh, Alan was welcome to be at the meetings. He was offering really good counsel. Um, and uh, he'd been here, of course, for over 40 years. Um, and I was taken back a bit when somebody commented that probably the majority of the conversation, con congregation, I've got it now, <laughs> the majority of the congregation uh, didn't know anything other than Alan. And uh, that was a fascinating uh, experience, I think. Uh, and so uh, I remember asking the first question on the first morning. So then, guys, 
uh, what sort of pastor do you think you're looking for? And I didn't let them answer the question because I then followed up and said, I hope you're not looking for someone like Alan. And I had a, speaking, a suspicion that uh, that may have been the case. And in fact, when I left my church, one of my church members said, oh, I do hope we can find someone like you, Jerry. Uh, but of course, God has different plans, doesn't he? And uh, it was a delight to work through uh, the, with the leadership team with all those changes uh, that took place um, and uh, eventually uh, to come to a position where uh, they published uh, all the material that they created. And uh, we heard on the grapevine that uh, the mark was coming uh, to be interviewed. Uh, and so I just wanted to say today, um, it was a long journey. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It helped with my experience. Uh, and I counted it a real privilege to be on that journey, to see God at work with the leadership team here, to see God at work with uh, Mark and Izzy and the family, uh, and see a fantastic outcome, which can, can clearly only be of God and the kingdom. So thank you for having me. Um, I only live up the road. I'm not going away. I will be back. Well, somebody else said that, didn't they? <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. And now to hear from the man himself, uh, <laughs> Mark's going to tell us how he sees the story that has brought him here. But I was a bit concerned about one thing that Roger said, that this was going to be the last of the formal bits, as if kind of from now on, informality reigns supreme. <laughs> I suspect there will be some more formal bits, not today, but in the future, because that's the way we work, formal and informal uh, working together. Come and, in your informal way, be formal. <laughs> Great. With Stuart in a suit and myself in kind of uh, what I'm wearing, it's kind of formal and informal working together. I'm just going to move this mic. Yeah, I'm breaking it again. I broke this mic, for those of you who weren't here, a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's something about coming up to speak, and you always want to fiddle with the mic first just to get yourself settled in. Um, but it clearly is not a good plan with this one. It's my great pleasure to just share something of God's goodness and his grace um, in our lives, particularly over the last nine months um, in, in the life of myself and Izzy and the children, and how um, we find ourselves here today. And I want to thank you all for joining in this occasion, for your love and your support. Uh, a special, obviously, shout out to Ed and the Battle Bus um, coming over here, but many others as well. I think it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it, to think about life as a story with different chapters. But I don't know if you've ever seriously considered where those chapter divisions might actually fall in your life, um, with all, I'm sure, the unexpected plot twists and turns. Uh, but I thought to give you an e example of this, and just to give you a bit of context for today, uh, I was thinking about the chapters of my Christian life. And um, I wanted just to share with you the summaries, so bear with me. Uh, chapter 1. A faltering start. As a young 19-year-old recently married to a beautiful Christian girl named Izzy, and leading up to the birth of our first child, Joshua, I decide to follow Jesus. But while attending church on a Sunday, I struggle to fully let go of the past and make this newfound faith a reality in my everyday life. Chapter 2, Fast Forward. Now aged 21, as Izzy and I are in the throes of a music degree at Bangor University with our young son in tow, I have a powerful encounter with God and am filled with the Holy Spirit. And this marks the start of a chapter full of adventures with Jesus, growing in prayer, loving God's word, and continuing ex to experience God's presence and his power, sometimes in dramatic ways. During this chapter, I'm baptised and I sense a call to ministry and my family and I move back to battle finally at the end of university and I enter the world of work. Rebecca is born and the call to ministry is still very much on my mind. Chapter three, stepping onto the battlefield. <laughs> Aged 25, I share with my pastor and friend Dennis, who's here today, about my call to ministry. And this is the start of an intense season of challenge for our family involving within a very short space of time the death of my sister, a miscarriage, and Rebecca being taken to hospital seriously unwell. 
And in this chapter, in spite of the challenges, God's supernatural and abundant peace guards our family in an extraordinary way. An amazing church family at battle rally round. I remember some of you here today just kneeling on the floor of our city room with us, just praying, just coming to pray and then going. And it's a period of increasing intimacy with God and continued experience of his power at work. And the resolve to follow God's call increases. And I commenced training in September 2013 as I turned 27. Chapter 4, following in the dark. Shortly after the birth of our third child, Tabitha, as my second year for ministry training commences, a huge storm hits at the heart of our family life. And as the battle rages, prayers seem to go unanswered, as our marriage seems irreparably broken. With life hopes and plans in tatters, there seems to be no way forward. There's a cloud over this season. Yet again, loving church family in battle and now for Izzy in Heathfield, along with great friends from Spurgeon's College, bring light and relief in the darkness. Throughout this chapter, crucial lessons are learned. Foundations are dug far deeper than before. Greater compassion is released in us. And God continues to work even when it's hard to discern what he's doing. My father passes away in December 2016. But this time of loss draws the whole family closer, including Izzy and myself. And the chapter closes with the hope of reconciliation in sight. It's hard to discern what the best title would be for the current chapter while I'm still in it. But if I had to give it a title, I'd optimistically call it a new day. And this is where the call to Willsborough comes in as well. It was as Izzy and I prepared to remarry towards the end of last year, which is a story in itself. And as I embarked on my final year as a newly accredited minister, a NAM, and if you don't know what that is, you don't need to know necessarily, <laughs> uh, that I sensed God might be calling me to move on from battle. And Izzy and I began to seek God together about what he might have in mind. And it's going to be a big move after a long time with a great church family, many of whom are here today. And it felt like God was drawing lots of different strands together all at once, some strands which had unraveled, which were now coming together again to bring out something new. I entered into this weird and wonderful world called Settlement, um, which you've already heard a bit about, uh, which is traditionally described as a, a kind of a dating service between Baptist ministers and churches. I guess that's a bit outdated now. I don't think we should compare it to something like Tinder, where you swipe left or right. We won't go there. But um, <laughs> even before entering the process, Stuart, as he said before, he'd mentioned Willsborough to me, and he felt that it might be a good fit and worth exploring. And I'm now beginning to understand some of the mixed motives that, that come into regional ministers as well. But Izzy and I um, had decided we were prepared to go anywhere. Uh, and so we said on the profile we submitted to the national settlement team, you know, just wherever. That meant that we were sent profiles from the far-flung corners of the country, probably some places where no one else wanted to go, I don't know. I'm praying and hoping they have ministers now who are probably far better than I am. But when we, when we looked up Willsborough, we'd actually been ignorant of where it actually was. And, um, and we found out it was just down the road in Ashford. And at first, actually, we were slightly thrown uh, because we were expecting a bigger move. You know, saying, God, send us anywhere. Just go down the road. It seemed but that's the way God works often, isn't it? Um, and we decided we should definitely explore it because Stuart had suggested it. And regional ministers, I think, are supposed to know about these kinds of things. So we went with what he said. And I ended up corresponding with one of the elders at Willsborough, a man named Roger Whiteley, who you've met. And this was very interesting because the name seemed familiar to me, and it actually was. Because I'd been in touch with Roger and briefly met him when he visited Hastings as part of this um, mission that we did, an evangelistic mission across the county in East Sussex. And to discover he was on the team at, at Willsborough, it seemed very intriguing to me. I met some of the team here at WBC. We met just up in, in the building that's now kind of falling down a bit over there. <laughs> and um, <laughs> hopefully soon to be sorted out. And I remember this was last December, instantly feeling at home with the team. 
and thinking they were people I'd love to just get to know better and, and maybe serve alongside. And I was delighted to receive a phone call back from Roger saying they'd like to invite me back to preach. And this part of the process is called a preach with a peep. And because in theory, no one else knows what you're here for apart from the leadership team. But to be honest, when the minister is retiring, um, really, it's, it was kind of Willsborough's worst kept secret, I think. <laughs> But by the time I came to preach at WBC in February, um, Izzy and I, we'd visited some other churches. I'd preached at some of them. And each time, we wanted to have that really clear sense that God was in it, you know. And, you know, we, wanted, we didn't want to proceed with anything unless God gave that kind of green light. And we weren't quite sure how that would happen. But that's what we were really looking for and seeking after. And so far, in the churches we'd visited, we hadn't had that confirmation. But when we came to WBC, it was different. We were really aware of God's presence with us throughout our time here, from the moment we were welcomed, um, and especially during the time of gathered worship. And I remember seeing how people prayed for one another and responded in the service, uh, and just having that sense of joy and kind of feeling inspired, really, at the unity and the strong relationships that there were across the church. One real God moment was when um, a lady in the church came and shared a prophetic word. It was spoken over the church many years ago, and it just really resonated with me. And I just felt my heart kind of leap and race and just thought, you know, God's, God's in this. And Izzy and I, we both left and shared with each other how for the first time, out of all the places that we'd um, visited, we'd be really disappointed if we didn't get a phone call back. <laughs> And yet again, Roger, the, the bearer of good news, rang to invite us back to preach with a view. And so this time, everyone was going to know what it was about. And the weekend before, we met down at MAF, just down the road here, um, with the wider leadership team. And um, I think I spent so long talking, um, which for those who know me, they'll find that very surprising, I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> And answering all kinds of questions that I almost lost my voice, actually, by the end of the day. In fact, I think Lexi came to my rescue with a, a glass of water, which I was very thankful for. The following weekend of the preach, both Izzy and I, as Roger said, got to sit up here together and, um, and answer a whole load of questions, which is actually more pleasant sounding than it, um, you know, more pleasant than it sounds. And we got these two stools, I think one of which um, Robin sat on, uh, the one that I had just kept sinking throughout <laughs> answering the questions, which I, I won't forget. Uh, yeah, that one. It, it might be quite a good metaphor, I don't know, for the Christian leadership journey. I, I'm not sure. But we shared our story, which is always hard, especially with a room of people who are looking at you thinking, could this person be our, our pastor? And I have to say, we were just overwhelmed with the, the kind of grace and love that we were shown by the church. And, and that was really, you know, the confirmation for us. We had to wait a whole week on tenterhooks for the church meeting's decision, which is, you know, not, not good planning. You've got, you've, got to, you've got to put those a bit sooner, I think. <laughs> Izzy says it was the longest week of her life. And I remember, again, I, I received a call from Roger the following Sunday as I was preparing for an evening service at Battle where he extended uh, the call to us on behalf of the church. At first, I didn't actually realize, Roger, that you were phoning from the meeting itself. Um, and actually, it wasn't, it wasn't until Roger said to me, would you like to say something to the meeting on speakerphone, that I realized that was the case, at which point my mind just went totally blank, and I managed to wheedle my way out of it, saying, no, no, just oh, please just pass on our, our thanks and say we'd love to accept the call. Izzy and I have both been hugely blessed by, uh, by both King's Church in Heathfield, where Izzy's been worshipping over the past few years, and, and Battle Baptist Church, where our journey began, and where I trained for ministry, and where I've been serving as associate pastor. We're so thankful for the way they've supported us and shown us Christ's love in amazing ways, and now releasing us to minister here. I want to especially thank Alan and Barbara as well. Um, Thank you for the kindness that you've shown us, the time that you've given to us, and the welcome and encouragement that you've been, uh, just sending cards and different things at just at the right time. Uh, and we thank God for the wonderful things he's done through your ministry here, and we feel really privileged to follow on from your ministry. Uh, and we particularly want you to know, on, on behalf of the whole uh, family here, that you've always got a home and a family at Willsborough, 
and uh, obviously we will be expecting visits. You don't get away that easily. I'm sure you will be appearing as a guest preacher at some stage in the near future. <laughs> there we go. I'm glad I sorted that out. It's always good as a minister to try and cover your slots, you know, when you're likely to be away. But we want to, um, <laughs> we want to thank everyone in the church here for making us so welcome as we've settled in. And we feel hugely blessed to be here. And above all, of course, we're, we are um, so thankful to our amazing God who, you know, he always um, works to, for our redemption, um, for our renewal, for our restoration. Day by day, um, he pours out new mercy and compassion on us and, and who loves this church and has a heart of compassion for this town. And I believe wants to touch our, our whole region and, uh, you know, our whole this whole corner of Europe in a special way. And the danger with an induction is people can focus on the wrong person, of course. You know, some might be tempted to look to the new pastor as if they hold the answers. Actually, I know you're not really that naive. Uh, some of you are probably wondering if I even know what the questions are. But, <laughs> but whilst we should be expectant and hopeful in this new season of church life, that hope is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. And, um, and his immeasurable power that is at work in us as well, his people. Psalm 127 verse 1, I know I quoted this only last week, says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. I'm sure the discerning among you know that actually I have very little, in fact nothing of any value to offer apart from what God is working in and through me, and the same goes for you as well. God is the one who needs to do what only he can do, and to the extent which I and the leadership team here and the whole church are willing to die to self, uh, to our, our pride and our shame, to our past successes and our past failures, to our grievances and disappointments, our unhelpful patterns of behaviour and ways of doing things, to anything that might hold us back. And therefore, to the extent which we allow him to transform us and to work through us by the power of his spirit, that's what will make a world of difference to the world around us. Through him, you know, with him, in him, it's all about Jesus. He's the head of this church and I am here to serve him and to serve you and to serve the community. And therefore, I really need your prayers, your continued prayers, that I remain faithful to the call that God has given me, just as I will be praying for you. We find ourselves in a vastly growing town at a strategic crossroads, which is in many ways at the centre of what looks like a chaotic picture currently in our nation. But to finish where we started, God always writes the best stories. You know, God has a better story to write in our lives and in Ashford, um, through all of his people across the churches. One that I think, like the, like the fountain that's on our logo that you might have on your programs, that reaches places that we never even expected. One that touches many lives and refreshes and blesses people who need Jesus and the life that he brings. And may those streams of living water flow in Ashford and beyond for his glory. Amen. Amen. You stay there. I think it's best if you stay there because you've already mucked that mic up, so I'm not giving you another one to play with. Uh, Mark. All Christians are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ and to follow in his way. Mark, as a Christian minister, you are first a disciple of Christ. And so I ask you to affirm afresh your faith and trust in God, a faith which you have already confessed as we've already heard, in baptism. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord? I do. Mark, you've been called to be the pastor of this church and congregation. Do you accept the charge from Christ to care for his people with all diligence and compassion? Will you care for the weak, 
Bring Christ's healing to the brokenhearted. Lift up the downcast and pray regularly for those committed to your care. I will. God's spirit empowering me. Will you equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ? Will you lead and enable God's people in their mission to the world, seeking God's kingdom, proclaiming the gospel in word and deed, and seeking to make Christ known in every way? I will, the risen Christ inspiring me. Will you make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? By your example, will you lead this church in all godly living and devotion to Christ through prayer and the reading of, the, of Scripture? Will you be faithful in the leading of worship, in presiding at the table of the Lord, and in preaching the Word of God? In the name of God, who is Father of all, the living Word, and the Spirit of unity, I will. Izzy, will you come and join us, please? If the girls will let you. <laughs> I think she knows her words. <laughs> Izzy, you have heard the promises made by Mark today. Will you join in that commitment to Christ and his people? promising to support and encourage him in his ministry in this church and community. I will. Now, those of you who are members of the church here, will you please stand? Okay. And that includes all the leaders who think they're getting away with it. Okay. <laughs> Do you believe that you have been called by God to work together humbly and willingly in serving this church and community. Amen. Do you promise to honour and respect one another, doing nothing from vain conceit, but in humility regarding others as better than yourselves? And do you promise to work with the members of this church in its calling to seek the kingdom of God? Amen. My sisters and brothers, a new chapter in the life of this church is opened today. I invite you now to renew your commitment to Christ and this church, to affirm again the vows of your baptism. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you confess Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord? Amen. Do you accept and welcome Mark as your minister and pastor? And do you promise to honour and support him with your love and prayers, working together with him in your shared calling to witness to Christ in this place? Amen. Paul the Apostle says you were bought with a price. Will you serve Jesus Christ as Lord, bearing witness to him and daily taking up your cross to follow him? Amen. And now may I invite the entire congregation to stand, please. As representatives of the wider church and community, will you offer your support at this new beginning in the life of church and minister? And will you join in praying for them all? Thank you. You may sit down. We come to you, our God and our Father in heaven. You're the sovereign God of plans and purposes, and we delight ourselves to be in the center of your will that we know Mark and Izzy are at this moment in time. May your grace-filled anointing be upon him, that anointing of your love, your peace, your joy, the anointing of opening up your word and the anointing of just drawing alongside people, pastor and people bound together in the bond of peace, in the joy of knowing you and serving you, believing you for the greater things that are yet to come here in this place. We give you thanks. Amen. Yeah, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this wonderful day which has been planned by you since before the creation of the world. We thank you that you have been preparing this church, both corporately and individually, 
and that you've been preparing Mark and Izzy and their family for this new season. We thank you so much that the time is now right for that season to begin. Father, we just pray now for Mark and Izzy and for Josh and Becca, Tabitha and Abigail. Father, we pray that they will quickly settle and become established in this community. Father, we pray that they will make good friends who will love and support them. Lord, we pray that you will bless this family and protect them. We ask for your protection, especially on this marriage partnership. Lord God, that they will find comfort and fulfilment in one another in all aspects of their relationship. Father, we pray they will find time to truly love and cherish one another and their children. Father, would you give them many good quality family times and adventures and memories. God, we pray that every one of them will be totally secure in the family, in the church and in the community. And moreover, Lord God, we pray that they would fully know and live from their identity in you. Yeah. And Father, we thank you that you have such a great plan for your church here in Willsborough. We pray especially for Mark as he is called to shepherd and lead the flock, that you will keep him close to you. We pray for the leadership team, that they would all quickly grow together in relationship and vision. And we ask as they devote themselves to you in worship and prayer, that you will give them increased revelation and wisdom to know how to move forward together as a church family. We pray that a renewed culture of love, honour and respect for one another would develop across the whole church. For as Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Father, we pray that this culture will be a powerful tool as the church seeks to reach out further into the surrounding area with the gospel. We ask you, Lord, to bring in a harvest of families and individuals who will be saved and added in. Yeah. And Lord, we pray too for times of refreshing as the church learns together to go deeper into you in worship. Lord, we ask there would be mighty manifestations of your presence and your power and that signs and wonders and miracles would become their regular experience. May they be a naturally supernatural body of people as Holy Spirit leads them. Lord, we bless this church in Jesus' mighty name. May God be glorified. Amen. 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 Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Father, we come to you knowing that you see us as your children. Father, and we lift up our brother and our sister. Lord, and we, we stand with them, Jesus. We stand with them in your delight, in your song and in your dance. Yeah, Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are the one that brings light in the darkness, Hallelujah. that you bring joy out of ashes, that you bring life out of the grave. And boy, do these guys know that, Lord. Yeah. And so, Lord Jesus, we celebrate with them in the way that you have yeah. led them through the valleys through the way that you have danced with them on the hilltops. The and Lord Jesus, we pray that as we, they go into this new chapter, Lord, that they would find even more of what it means to find life in all its muchness, all its width and height and depth. Lord, in all its fullness in you, Lord Jesus. Father, for Mark and Izzy and their family, Lord, would they truly flourish in this place and know your song, Lord, to find joy in you and in these people. Lord, would the sun fall on their faces every day that they spend here, Lord Jesus. Would you guide them when you be glorified, we pray. Amen. 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 The Lord says, be bold and be strong. Be very courageous. Do not be discouraged, for I go with you and ahead of you, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Amen. Father, I want to say thank you that um, we've got so much of the example of Jesus written down for us. And Jesus, when you were here on earth, you said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then you talked about the harvest and the sower and the reaper rejoicing together. 
and that you will reap, Mark, where others have sown. So there's a partnership between those that have gone before you and, and sown good seed here. And you're coming along now with Izzy to help them reap a harvest. And Father, I want to pray that in that process, there will be such an anointing from heaven on all that they say and do together. That, Father, the honor will go to you. I pray that everything will be Christ-centered, Christ-honoring, Christ-glorifying from the beginning to the end. Would you protect them in their desire to honor you, Lord, and to serve you faithfully? And would you give joy in the offering? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And Lord, uh, we want to give you thanks uh, now for uh, uh, all that has gone on before, for the most amazing uh, season that you have drawn to a close in uh, wonderful love and compassion. And we want to thank you for the now. And we want to thank you for Mark and Izzy and the family coming. And we thank you for all that you have done to ensure your will be done for them in this place. And Lord, we want to pray for the future. And, and we pray that you will just bind uh, these guys together with those cords that cannot be broken. Would you put a hedge of protection, please, around this church family uh, and around Izzy and Mark and the family as well, that absolutely nothing, nothing will uh, be able to spoil the plan that you have for them. And Lord, we pray into that future, an exciting time, a time of anticipation, a time of love and going forward for the kingdom's sake. So, Lord, will you have your way with these folk and will you bless them mightily and anoint them? And we ask for this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, Mark and Izzy, the, uh, the Queen was recently walking uh, near Balmoral and a, grump, a group of American tourists came across her as she was walking along with her, uh, with her minder. And uh, they didn't recognize her. And they said, uh, oh, you know, are you, um, have you ever met the queen? <laughs> and she said, um, um, no, but this gentleman might have done, pointing to her minder. <laughs> and they walked on their way, not having realized who they'd met. Mark and Izzy, you are here as representatives of the living God. And as people meet you, they're not just meeting Mark and Izzy. They're not even just meeting a Baptist minister and his wife. They're meeting representatives of the living God. Amen. May he bless you, anoint you, equip you for everything to see great things happening for the glory of his name in this place. Amen. 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 Mark Hurst, take, me, take your hand. There you go, my man. <laughs> we do the official bit. Mark Hurst, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Baptist Union of Great Britain, and on behalf of this church, I declare you inducted to the pastorate of this church and congregation. As you lead the people of God and care for them, as you serve and pray for this community, may the Lord richly bless and sustain you. And now will you join me in blessing Mark as we say, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You're in. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Andy, Andy Caldwell. Uh, I, I, I met Mark in that chapter, that dark chapter, uh, and Izzy. And uh, I don't know, I've been to quite a few inductions in my time. Uh, I've been in ministry 25 years. And uh, I, I thought Mark's induction speech was probably 
the most beautiful one that I've ever, ever heard. And uh, it, it touched me deeply. I, I, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't need to preach. I don't need to preach. Uh, and I'm really, and I said to him, I don't need to preach. In fact, as I went, I went to the toilet um, and I heard someone saying, I think it's finished now. <laughs> I, I, and, I, <laughs> and I thought, oh dear. And I said, I said to Mark, I said, you know, I, I can preach for a long time. And he said, I know. I said, but what about? Anyway, I wonder if you'd turn in your Bibles to, to Romans uh, chapter 12. I am going to preach. I, I'll, uh, I'll shave bits off here and there. I, I, I'm so grateful that I, I, when I follow uh, Stuart, because uh, I, I think he is, the, he is the best joke teller uh, in the Baptist Union, and it, it means I don't ever have to tell jokes. Uh, it, he's <laughs> he's so he's so good. Uh, so that'll shave off that'll shave off a bit of time, won't it? If I don't tell any jokes. Um, I, I was really hoping for a steer from Mark um, about what he would like me to preach on, and and uh, when I texted him at the beginning of the summer and said, "What would you like me to preach?" But he said, "Oh, you you choose." You choose. And, uh, and so I had to pray and I had to seek God. And uh, I just kept getting the word gift. Gift. Uh, and uh, I saw, saw Mark as a gift to me and Izzy and, and the children who, who, are, who I love deeply as real gifts to me. And I realized that, that Mark is a gift to you. And I realized that Mark is building on the gift of Alan and Barbara, is it? The, the gift of them to you. I thought, God's been very good to you. Incredibly biblical, 40 years. Moses led the children of Israel 40 years. He got exasperated with them at times. In fact, there's that, that terrible bit in, in, in Deuteronomy which says, look, if it wasn't for you, if I didn't get so angry at you, I would be able to go into the promised land. But it is, as it is, I have to climb up the hill and I'm going to die. I'm going to see the land. I'm going to die. It's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> well, yet. It, it will, but not yet. Uh, uh, but of course, there's that moment where he hands over, after 40 years, hands over to, to, to Joshua who is knocking on a bit. I mean, he's not 32, 33, how old? 32. Because he's been through it all through the 40 years as well. And, uh, but there's this handing over, this gift of leadership. And, uh, I, and I, I, I wanted to, to talk about that with you, this gift of leadership that, that God gives to his people. And uh, as I do that, I'm mindful that really in the New Testament, uh, th this word leadership, the word that I'm going to be talking about, really only appears, I think, six times, two of those quite negatively, uh, about the blind leading the blind uh, and, and the rich young ruler, uh, and four times positively, uh, whereas the word servant <laughs> is over a thousand times in the New Testament. So I have that. In my head. I also have in my head the context in, in which we live. I felt I needed to ask the lady, lady mayor, you know, which party she stood for so I didn't get anything wrong today. And uh, I needed to know, uh, that's between her and me. Uh, no, it's not. I mean, it's public knowledge. Uh, so, I, you know, I, so I knew exactly why. But we are in a state of, of, of crisis of leadership. I think we would all recognize that wherever we sit. Leadership has been in the news so much, so I'm aware that we all have a context uh, and an uncertainty, uh, and it's been mentioned by Stuart a number of times, uh, a crisis of leadership. We've had leadership elections. We've had leadership s s scandals. Uh, there is a growing mistrust of, of leadership, uh, uh, of experts 
you, you know, we, we, hear, we don't want an expert anymore. We don't want to hear what the experts say. We, 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 we want, to, we want to, to do it ourselves. And so we, we have this huge context that we come into, biblical and cultural that we're in. And I'm aware that, that while some of us like to be led, actually Adam and Eve live within us still. And, and of course, you remember Adam and Eve, they, uh, they were offered, Eve was offered this, this choice to, by, by God. He said, you can, you can basically you fill your boots. You've got all these trees, you've got everything. You can fill your boots, you can eat whatever you want. But there's one, one tree where you can't go. Don't eat there. On that day, you'll die. And, and we know the story. Uh, the serpent, who was craftier than anything else, he came and he said to her, has, has God really said? And she said, yeah, we mustn't even touch. She went a bit further. She said, we can't even touch the tree. Uh, can't eat the fruit. And, and he says, well, you know, there's a reason why you can't touch that fruit, why you can't eat that fruit. It's because God knows something and he's not told you it. That when you eat that fruit, you will become, you know it, just like him. You'll be God. You'll be a God. That was the offer of Satan in the garden. You will be your own God. You will be it. You will be number one. And so John Stott said, the pulpit is a dangerous place for any child of Adam. The pews are a dangerous place for any child of Adam or, or, or Eve. Because we still have that. We want to be in charge. We want to call the shots. And even those of us that like to be led, we like to be led by people we like to be led by. We know that. And when we're led by those we disagree with or those we don't like or those you know, we don't warm to, we, we, we struggle deeply. So we have, we have a context, a biblical context, we have a, a cultural context, and we have a very personal context when we come to this word. I, I love what President Harry Truman said about the gift of leadership or leading. He said this, leaders are people who can get others to do what they don't want to do and make them like doing it. That's pretty neat, actually. Leaders are people who can get others to do what they don't want to do and make them like doing it. Hmm. The word leader for us is, an, it is a Norse word. It, it's come from the Vikings, uh, Lida, and it has to do with someone who cuts through the ice. That's where we actually get our word leader from. Uh, the biblical word it is, is different. We'll come to that in a bit when we, when we open the Bible. I tend to think of leadership, personally myself, as influence. A leader influences and change, changes the ethos around them, changes situations around them. Paul, in First Thessalonians chapter 6, verse 12, he, he talks about churches honoring their leaders. And, and he gives this definition. They labor hard. They labor hard among you. Caring. Oh, we love that. They labor hard. Caring. And admonishing. We don't like that. We don't like that. We like the caring. That's, that's good. Admonishing. Stirring us up, telling us off. Mm. No th child of Adam, you see. So I wanted to think about this gift of Mark. And, and so my sermon, which hasn't even started yet, just in case. <laughs> just as well, I dropped all the jokes. Uh, is, is, is in this context of who we are, who Mark is, who Alan is, who we are. What God's saying to all of us this day. So here we are. Let's read Romans 12 verses 6 
and 8. It talks about gifts given to the church, functioning in the church. And he says these words. If I talked a little less and found my place a little earlier, we'd be all right. He says, he says this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So straight away, great verse for all of us. Let us use our gifts. Love one of the adverts coming in saying, if you're musical, see one of the worship leaders. I loved it. If you've got a gift, let's start using it. I love that. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in their teaching, the one who exalts in their exhortation, the one who contributes generously in generosity, the one who leads. With zeal. Mark, this is for you at this moment. The one who leads, lead with zeal, my friend. My boy, I love you so much. I love you so, so much. Lead with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. When God does a work, He always raises up a man or woman to start that work. In the center of that work will be a man or woman who is devoted passionately, deep within their being, loving, serving, seeing God and knowing what God has called them to do. Always. You know, our history, the Methodist church, begins with one such as that. All mass movements start with someone who God uses, who knows God intimately, is a worshipper, and who knows what God is saying and is willing to follow him. Through the darkness, through the good times, through the criticism. We see it. We know it. We know it's true in the Bible. Abraham, Moses, Joshua. We see it all the time. God raises up men and women. Gideon, Deborah, who are intimately connected with God. Who have this relationship with him that is front and center. And that compels them. It's not the compelling that makes them go. It's the relationship deep within. It's who they are that determines what they do. Throughout the Bible, King David, worshipper, intimately in love with God who leads the people. Nehemiah, who weeps and prays and sees a vision. You know, people will will mock you, perhaps, because you see the unseen. Certainly true of Nehemiah. He saw the unseen. He saw these walls. And his intimate, passionate, dependent relationship on God drove him even when they mocked him, when they said a fox can knock down those walls, I tell you, we've we've been to those walls. They're still there. They're still there. Thousands of years later, he sees the unseen. He's connected and rooting with God, and he goes, pro-esteemy, the one who leads. pro The one who leads. pro It's a great word. This is the different ways that it's used throughout the Bible. Stand before. Rule over. God. That's one of my favorites. God. A pastor is a 
God, my friend. I, I love King David. You, you, you know this. King David, he, he goes out to fight uh, uh, the, the, the giant. Um, you all know who that is. I've, thank you, Goliath. I sort of had a Boris moment there. Uh, and, you know, it's funny enough. You know, I don't know if you saw his speech on Thursday with all the police and everything. I trained for my police here. Well, not here. But in Ashford, the police training school. I did you train here as well, Jerry? Yeah, you did. Uh, uh, you know, and he, of course, he started with the, the caution. It's changed a lot since my day, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but Goliath. And, and you know exactly what happens. Saul sees this young boy, and he says, you can't possibly go out and, and fight this giant. You, you can't do it. And... Uh, he says, that put, put on this, this armor. He, he says, you know, you're just a boy. While he's having this, this exchange, he says, you're just a boy. I don't know if anyone's going to say that to you. You're just a boy. This is what King David says. Well, actually, the mayor did say that to me. <laughs> she did say that. I said, yeah, at our church, we call him Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> just a, Sorry. Just, just, it is true. Thank you. It's all true. <laughs> so he, the, 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 King Saul is saying, you're just a boy. And, and King David, he's not King David, he's boy David. He says, look, the same God who defended me when, when I protected my sheep against the lion and the bear is the same God who's going to protect me against Goliath. I love that. It's pastor. He was a shepherd boy. The God who protected me against the lion and the bear is that God who's with you. I love that in pro esteemy. That word God, you're a God. You're a protector. Uh, maintain. Care for. I love those words. This has been translated often in 1 Thessalonians chapter 6. One who cares. Laboring diligently to care. I love that. It's leadership. And so God has given you a gift, WBC. He's given you two great leaders. One building, standing on the shoulders of a giant. And I love that. But I got more. And so I wonder if you turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. It's going to come up on, on your screen as well. Luke 22. Because we can get really derailed in this whole thing about leadership unless we have a model. And with the greatest of respect, uh, we have in our society, in our world, somehow separated leadership, the function of a leader, from the character of a leader. And, and I have to tread very carefully here um, because politics is involved and I'm not making a political point. But we have become enamored with personality and celebrity and, and that means that as a, a world, as a culture, we want personalities or celebrities to lead us. So, so Ukraine, I think he's doing a good job, but the Ukraine, he's a comedian. But, he, but he's loved and he's liked and he, he, played, he played the president in a show. And the, the line between fact and fiction got so blurred that, that, that they have elected him. Uh, the American Lord Sugar, Mr. Trump, of course, was a reality TV star, uh, famous for Your Fired, The Apprentice. Uh, and I, I saw Christian leaders, and I see, see Christian leaders who say, we are electing a president, not a pastor. And so it doesn't matter that he is morally not good. 
as long as he is functionally good. And that's our world. That's the world we live in. We can try and influence it. We can try and be salt and light in it. But that is the... But not so with us. Let's have a read of, of, of this. Luke chapter 22. And we've got the verses up there. Verse 14. This is in the upper room. This is the last supper. And here is Jesus. When the hour came, he, Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. There's two things in that. I, I just want to draw your attention. The earnest desire of the Savior to eat Passover with his crew, one of which is Judas, by the way. This earnest desire, this longing deep from within him, to, to celebrate and worship God before he suffers. Or what are you like going to the dentist? I'm pretty abysmal going to the dentist. I, I, I can get nervous for days before going to the dentist. That's the dentist. True God of true God, light of light eternal poured himself out, became flesh and blood, was whipped and mocked, was slapped by the high priest's servant, saying, how dare you speak to the high priest like that? The, the, the high priest was the very one who was supposed to recognize the coming of God, who was tortured and nailed to a cross, who was forsaken by his friends, separated from the Father. He is going to suffer like no one here ever will, because he did. He's going to sweat blood, so we don't. He's going to contemplate the cup of God's wrath, so we will never have to. He is going to know suffering to such a degree. And he says, it's my earnest desire. It's my earnest desire to worship God with you. To share this meal with you before I suffer. That's leadership. Oh, where's that leadership? Where, tell me, where is that leadership outside of Jesus? Let's see what happens. Let's see what the boys will do. Verse 16. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, broke it giving it to them, gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is incredible. Hours before his arrest, his betrayal, his torture, his death. He is there pouring himself out. That's leadership. I am sure, Barbara and Alan, you know. Pouring yourself out. Spending yourself. You know that. Guy knows that. Ed knows that. Dennis knows that. Jerry knows that. Stuart, I could go on. Jim Sutton knows that. Pouring ourselves out. But we know nothing. We know nothing in comparison with this. It's what he's calling you to. 
And likewise, verse 20, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. It's probably the third cup of the Passover, the cup representing God's redemption. This is for you. Verse 21, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it's been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Verse 23. Notice this contrast. Jesus, who is earnestly desiring to worship and eat and be with them, and serves them this meal saying, this represents me. This is what I am doing for you. I am pouring myself out. I am giving myself for you. This self-giving leader. Look what happens next. They began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. So here is Jesus pouring himself out, giving himself out, and here are the disciples. Here is me, and all I'm thinking about is me. So busy thinking about who's going to do this. And we're all a bit like that. You know, it, you know when the teacher says, we're not going to leave this room until someone owns up, probably we all want to own up. We all live with this vague guilt. We, we all have it. They know, you know, the one who's betraying him knows he's just taken the silver. The others... They surely know they haven't betrayed him. They haven't taken the silver. But here's the thing. We all live with this idea we're not good enough. We all live with this idea that we're failures. We all live with this imp imposter complex. My, my son, who he's, he's 18, he's just got his A-level results. And he, he's been in state schools all his life. Uh, and uh, he, he amazingly has got into Cambridge uh, to study law. And uh, last night, he, 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 he had a meltdown, saying, I just feel an imposter. How, how am I going to do this? The people there are actually deserve to be there. I don't, we all have that. This vague, that is from the enemy. That feeling, that vague feeling of not being good enough, of not being in, of not being loved, of not being held, that's from the enemy. It's vague. When God speaks to us, he is specific. His Holy Spirit puts his finger on it specifically and accurately so that we can confess, we can repent, and we can live new life. But there's this feeling of vague guilt, and they've all got it. Is it me? Is it me? Who is it? Is it you? And very quickly it turns from, is it me? Is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? To, I bet it's you. <laughs> I bet it's Philip. I, his eyes are a bit close together, aren't they? <laughs> Thaddeus, could it be you? I mean, we don't even know your name. Is it you, Thaddeus? And look what happens. It moves from that very quickly to verse 24. A dispute also rose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. A dispute arose among them about who was to be regarded as, a, as the greatest. Again, I want to tread very carefully, but I wonder if some of our problems in this day are because there are groups of people who want to be the greatest. Across the board, across the House of Commons, within the country, within EMPs, MEPs. I'm not singling anyone out. There's a lot of that out there. Oh, House of Commons, there's a lot of who wants to be the greatest. Ashford. There's a lot of who wants to be the greatest in Ashford. I'm sure you, you are, you are. You heard it here first. There's probably a lot of that in WBC, who wants to be the greatest? Because I know the truth, there's a lot of that in here. Who wants to be the, I want to be the greatest. And so we've got this thing, is it me, Lord? Is it you? You know, it's not me, I'm going to be great. I'm going to, look, you know, 
I'm going to, when he's gone, I'm going to be the, I'm not going to, re- oh, you know, you can just hear it. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. Jesus steps in. The contrast is just painful. It's jarring. Jesus, who is giving, is pouring himself out, who's going to go to the cross for them, die the death they deserve. And then, and he says, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, even though they're not. But not so with you. Mark, not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader, my friend, as one who serves. My friend. For who is the greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Let me finish the Bible reading there so we can get to our tea and and finish. So, Mark, we've got the function of leadership, which you've just been installed into, and we've got the character of leadership, which can only happen as you engage, as you engage, intimately follow him as you my friend model Jesus come to me all you who are weary and I will give you rest he said for I am gentle and humble of heart oh the greatest leader ever that's you but here's the thing each one of us in our own way is a leader Leader of the council here. Leaders in our mission areas and our ministry areas. Leaders in our families. Leaders in our workplace. Every single one of us in this room has a form of leadership. Because you influence people around you. By your very being. I I love your logo here, WBC. I love it. I I, I can see it's a, a fountain. Uh, but do you know, I, I only found that out when you said that. I, I thought it was like someone chucking stones from the middle of the pond out into the pond. And the ripples just going out. I, I like what it really is better. <laughs> but I just saw it as someone throwing stones and the pond being transformed. All these ripples going out into the community, into the homes, into the workplaces, into the church, as you yourself are leaders. All of you are leaders. And Jesus says to all of us, where we have influence, where we lead, let us do it with zeal. Romans 8, where I started. No, Romans 12, verse 8, where I started. And where I'm about to finish. You are called to lead with zeal. It's one place in the Bible where it talks of Jesus having zeal. And the theologians, the preachers, you you all know where that is. It's when Jesus went into the temple and overturned the tables. And the disciples are so, again, jarring, disjointed that Jesus... Come to me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. He's overturning tables. And they write down, they remembered the verse. Zeal for your house consumes me. I love that. Jesus' zeal was not, because this is what we think. We think zeal is some kind of of out-of-control passion. It is not. Jesus was not out of control. John tells us very carefully that he made a whip. He sat down and he made a whip. It takes time. It takes concentration. Zeal is not an 
out of control emotionalism. But zeal is something that we build through regular habits. It's five. I'm finishing, don't worry. Five regular habits. A regular reading habit. The Bible. Biographies. A regular reading habit. Mark and I, we, we do a Bible app together. We're always liking each other's you know, pa- Bible passages and where we're doing it. And we do that together. Uh, this man, I'm, sure, I'm saying this on your behalf, he'll do that with you. You version Bible study. A regular reading habit. And you will be developing zeal within you. You see, zeal comes from the weight of the intimacy and the depth of our relationship with God. Regular reading habit. A regular praying habit. A regular worship habit. What a gift to have this worship team. What a gift. A regular worship habit. A regular fellowship habit. There is nowhere like church for rubbing off the the rough edges, for humbling us, for causing us to pray. It's regular habits. Fifth, a regular thanksgiving. In the midst of Jesus' pouring out, in the midst of this Last Supper, we're told, after giving thanks. A regular reading habit, a regular praying habit, a regular worship habit, a regular fellowship habit, a regular thanksgiving. And you, my son, will be building zeal and modeling zeal that this church will transform this town for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for this family, this church, this mission, this calling, this destiny. I thank you that you are here and great things have been done and great things lie before Because you are our God. We pray for our mayor here. And we pray in the name of Jesus. You would give her everything she needs in these days. These days of uncertainty. These days of criticism. These days. Would you strengthen her. And give her everything she needs to. And Lord we ask in your precious name through our regular daily habits, that zeal for you would consume us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessing of you. And just to say, massive thank you again for coming. And a huge thank you also to everyone who's taken part in in making this service happen. It's it's amazing, and uh, I love and appreciate you all so much. So let's, uh, let's give thanks for the food. Father God, we thank you for um, the wonderful time of fellowship that we've shared together. Lord, we, I thank you for the gift that every person in this room is. Uh, and Lord, for your amazing and overwhelming generosity to us. Um, and just a picture of that in all the food that we're going to be sharing together. But Lord, we pray throughout it all, we will just know uh, the blessing of your spirit upon our time together and our conversations. In Jesus' name, amen. So may you know the Father's love and experience the joy of being his children day by day. May you know the risen Christ who empowers you and strengthens you to live out his call in your lives. And may you lead those around you uh, diligently and with zeal. May you serve them sacrificially and may he enable you to pour out yourself for them. And may the Holy Spirit uh, just assure you of the Father's presence with you day by day as you serve him, as you live for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.